Hi, I'm Drago Angelov. Uh, thank you for having me. I lead the research team at Waymo. In this talk, I will give you an overview of our recent work on scaling 3D detection to the long tail. Uh, overall, uh, we have eight papers accepted at this ECCV conference on different topics, and I invite you to check them out. Waymo is Alphabet's autonomous driving technology company. We are building the world's most experienced driver and focusing on two categories, moving people, which we do through Waymo One, our ride hailing service, and moving commercial goods, which we do uh, with our uh, commercial arm called Waymo Via that features these class A trucks uh, and also local delivery. Uh, our goal is to have fully autonomous rider-only operations. Rider-only means uh, no one in the driver's seat at all. So you can hail a car through your app, uh, and uh, you would get a fully empty vehicle that can take you anywhere you like. Currently, we have uh, rider-only operations in Phoenix Dees Valley, San Francisco, and downtown Phoenix. Uh, and we just recently shared that Los Angeles will be Waymo's next ride-hailing city. Uh, since October 2020, we have been offering Waymo One, the world's first fully autonomous uh, service in Phoenix East Valley with 100% of rides without human drivers. And uh, this service uh, there has been operating ever since. In March of 2022, uh, we had our first rider-only ride in San Francisco, uh, which I will show you. Even the first ride uh, is quite eventful. There is this double loading truck um, uh, in, the, in the middle. There is a, actually, the, this is double park truck. Um, and then we continue. So one thing I will show you, this is our visualization on top. This shows the light upon. Our sensor suite has camera LiDAR radar, and uh, you can see that the points on the vehicles are in very high resolution because we have a wonderful radar in our fifth generation. Uh, here we just got, uh, you know, gave room to a cyclist uh, to cross in front of us. Uh, we will uh, try to turn left here, and uh, we want uh, to uh, make our way without necessarily having all the oncoming cars go through, which we succeed at. Um, maybe a few more interesting scenarios. So here, as we turn left, you will see there is a parking vehicle in front of us. So we comfortably let them uh, park and proceed around them. So uh, while I love this visualization, I think it's very cool and shows off our lighter a little bit. Um, you know, I have been on the vehicle myself a few times in the city, uh, driving uh, fully autonomously, and it's quite an experience. And so I wanted to show you what it looks like from inside the car. So it's a bit of a different thrill seeing the steering wheel and what it is like to be in there. It's very exciting, maybe a different level of excitement as much as I like our other viewer. And uh, hopefully it gets boring after a while, but uh, we do this a lot. And we have been doing right around the operations in San Francisco on a very regular cadence in reasonable volume ever since. So I showed you scenes of San Francisco, but the Waymo driver needs to handle diverse operating domains. So San Francisco is dense urban, but we also want to do suburban uh, areas and freeways and of course we want to do them in all kinds of weather and so that's one challenge uh, of our task another is that we want to handle very interactive environments so one of the uh, aspects that make uh, autonomous driving challenging is just the sheer amount of uh, people and vehicles uh, that are in the streets and uh, they can exhibit a variety of different behaviors. So what you see here actually is us driving fully autonomously um, after a baseball game in San Francisco. So you can see people leaving, uh, getting into the vehicles, crossing the street. And here is uh, the Waymo driver uh, making a very good and uh, safe progress through this crowded scene. So you can see people getting out of the parking garages, cutting in, turning around. Here, here we keep going. 
And another thing I would point out is uh, you can see just how much objects and people there are around us um, can be a very crowded, complex environment, and we are dealing with all of this uh, quite well. So uh, one more challenge that pertains to the topic of this talk is uh, long tail. So you can get a lot of very different things happen to you if you drive millions of miles. So this is just one of them. Uh, what you see here is, so there's a pickup truck at 64 miles an hour, a barbecue falls out and goes straight in the path that we're driving. Um, here's another one where, you know, you can have a house on wheels uh, moving around. Uh, that's actually reasonably common, but still interesting. You need to understand these distinctions. So the rest of the talk will be on how do we handle better this long tail and more efficiently uh, in our perception systems. Um, and uh, good talk on scalability starts with uh, scalable neural net architectures. I think they're the foundation on which the rest of the um, capabilities are built, and we want to pick such uh, architectures that have good scaling properties. So I'll give you a little bit, uh, I'll take you through a history of this. So as you know, uh, those of you in this workshop should be well aware, LIDAR-based 3D detection has seen significant improvements in the past few years. Some of the most popular techniques would extract features from the 3D point cloud, render them in the top-down view, and then apply typical object detection model architectures on top. So this is one method that's quite popular called point pillars. Um, and this is a great method, quite simple and high performant. And it has one interesting property though, a drawback, which is that uh, because we form this dense top-down image, it scales quadratically with the range. And uh, as our LiDARs have been improving themselves dramatically over the last few years. The range has become 200, 300 meters. At such range, it starts becoming prohibitive, creating and maintaining this uh, dense top-down bird's eye view uh, with pillars. And so uh, maybe a couple of years ago, we set ourselves the challenge, can we have a high performance model that actually does not depend on range? And uh, I would like to, of course, say we succeeded. Uh, last year in CVPR, we presented a model called Range SparseNet. And uh, I'll just give you a short overview of this method. This architecture does a lot of the processing in the native range image representation, which is the uh, dense uh, representation containing uh, the LiDAR scans themselves. So here in y-axis, you have the LiDAR beams of uh, the sensor. On the x-axis, you have the azimuth angle. So as the sensor is spinning, it keeps capturing and drawing this range image. Um, so we process the range images themselves uh, and extract features. And we also segment uh, the foreground objects of interest in these range images. This selects maybe 10% of the points of your, in many cases, of uh, what could be objects of interest. And then we project these points uh, just the foreground points in uh, 3D, in bird's eye view. Now, this is a sparse point cloud, um, and it's a relatively small one. It does not contain all the points uh, initially in uh, uh, captured by the LiDAR. And so now we maintain this sparse representation. So to do that, we do sparse processing. Um, and we do this with uh, sparse convolution operations. There's multiple layers of sparse convolution uh, that produces upgraded features in bird's eye view where things generalize better. Then we apply a box regression head, a reasonably standard one, and we get 3D boxes. And so you will see that none of the steps of this method explicitly dependent on range, which is great, which uh, yields a very uh, performant method. And this is in red. On the left, you have uh, vehicle performance on the right you have pedestrian performance on x-axis we have latency so left is better much faster uh, on the y-axis you have quality in uh, in bounding boxes and you can see that our methods uh dominated uh at least the contemporaries from about a year or so ago in both quality and especially uh latency so that pro that provides a very efficient methods for very long ranges and short ranges so this is great, right? Uh, well, 
we set ourselves the next question at that point, which is, uh, can we have a model with better scaling properties? So the model was good, but maybe we could do even better. And so um, we were inspired particularly by the great success of transformers, uh, which have been revolutionizing quite a lot of fields in computer vision and language processing. And so they have great scaling properties. They have great capacity for learning, uh, ultimately, general patterns, and then why not 3D uh, modeling patterns? Now, so we wanted to do this, but with two constraints. So one of them is uh, preserve this insight of sparsity that we had in uh, RSN. We did not want a model that grows quadratically with range. And furthermore, based on our experience with RSN, we wanted to address some limitations of the 3D, 3 by 3 sparse convolutions. Specifically, uh, they are unable to pass information among point islands that are not closely connected in 3D space. Um, just the receptive field is reasonably small. And uh, also, they're incompatible with MATMAL uh, accel hardware accelerators, such as uh, tensor processing units. So we wanted to mitigate this. And in this ECCV, we have a paper um, that achieves this uh, called Sparse Window Transformer for 3D Object Detection in Point Clouds. In this work, we take some inspiration from the Swin Transformer, which uh, is a predecessor work uh, on images that propose to partition them into windows and merge the context information from these images in a hierarchical manner using transformers. Uh, our method uh, makes several key adaptations of swim transformers to enable efficient sparse feature process. So this is the overall architecture of our model. It takes a sequence of point clouds as input and does the standard point pillar style voxelization, um, which produces a set of sparse features um, where we have lighter points. Then these sparse features are processed by several layers of SW former blocks one block uh, per hierarchical scale. Uh, these multi-scale features then are fused with transformer layers and sparse sampling operations. And we have several heads at several resolution detecting objects of different sizes. So let's dig into the block. Uh, this is the sparse window transformer block. It's the basic building block of our backbone. It's similar to swim transformers, but contains several innovations aimed at efficiently processing sparse inputs. So we process features in 10 by 10 sparse windows and shift the window partitions between layers. Um, note that 10 by 10 window is a lot more than the 3 by 3 convolutional filters, which allows us to capture more uh, context. Although each window has the same spatial size, such as a 10 by 10 voxel grid, the number of non-empty voxel in each window can vary significantly. And so our first adaptation is to add the buck bucketing-based window partition for these windows. So we group uh, the features of these windows into buckets with different effective sequence lengths. And that's for efficiency on accelerated hardware. Compared to Swing Transformer, we minimize the use of window shift operations as well. Uh, so these window shift operations are expensive in a sparse world on uh, tensor processing units as well. And so we do only one shift operation in each block. And like Swing Transformer, which just can do set. Uh, we have also observed that anchor-based detectors, uh, their performance is closely related to the average difference between where the anchor is and the ground truth. And so this can be addressed one way effectively with two-stage methods, but at the cost of more compute. And another approach are methods like CenterNet, which strive to define anchors in the center of the ground truth boxes, which enforces distributions closer to zero mean and smaller variance. However, in the sparse setting, the centers of objects may not have any voxels. And this phenomenon particularly affects large objects, such as buses or trucks, uh, where the object center can be quite far from any sparse voxels. And so uh, to mitigate this issue or to improve the quality, based on this insight, we propose a voxel diffusion model. So it's a different head design. And uh, um, at the core of this design is that, you know, first we segment voxels uh, in bird's eye view towards the end to be foreground to background. The background voxels are dropped. And uh, for foreground, we ap apply max pooling operations shown in this picture uh, with the specific diffusion size relevant to the size of objects we expect to detect. 
And so after diffusing to nearby voxels, uh, we apply a one sparse window transformer layer and apply a standard box head, and that, that improves the results, uh, especially for large objects. And so how well does this do? Well, it actually achieves state of the art for lighter detectors on the WAMO open data set. This is the result on the test set. It outperforms, um, well, all the methods, single or two stage methods that are often a lot more uh, computationally expensive than uh, sparse window transformer. And uh, our method also uh, achieves quite strong results, not only on the 3D detection, but on the lighter semantic segmentation task as well. And uh, here are some results on large vehicles. Since we talked about large objects, you can see that on them, the performance increase is particularly strong. So while on average, maybe you get around one uh, MAP, on large objects, you can get up to six or seven. And uh, we also uh, compared to RSM, which is, uh, well, what we intuitively would want. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, these gains are due to our uh, careful, uh, carefully thought, thought out transformer design and also uh, innovations such as the voxel diffusion model. Uh, now, we don't only do lighter architectures. So we have another paper at this conference on a camera radar fusion architecture. Um, and uh, this is just a shout out, a poster. <laughs> uh, please go check out the work uh, at the conference if you're interested. Ultimately, camera and radar have very complementary strengths, uh, but their fusion is an underexplored domain. It's very natural to fuse these two uh, sensors. And we show how to do this well with uh, transformer based uh, sensor fusion setup. Please check out our poster uh, to see uh, that type of work. Now, I will move to a different topic, which is active learning with rare examples. The story here starts with our auto-labeling uh, work from a year ago. So this work was driven by the idea that after we've collected the examples uh, in the real world, off-board, we have one, a lot more compute, and two, uh, we have the benefit of seeing how objects look not just in the past, but in the future. And so over long periods of time, we can see how an object looks from all angles, uh, typically. In the, and that allows us to estimate really accurately its shape. Also, if we are able to uh, detect these objects and track them in time, we can refine the trajectory over time for every object to be really, really accurate, as you can see in this video. So even in a very crowded scene, this is our vehicle. We maintain a very rich set of boxes very consistently with very little noise. Um, and that is, of course, great. It provides auto labels. So we can offboard create uh, through this system a lot of bounding boxes that actually can then be even trained, uh, used to train models. So you can label sequences completely automatically. And we show that on average, this box quality is as good or quite almost as good as human labelers. So that's great. Of course, uh, let's look what happens for the long tail. Um, so at the top, you have the performance here of uh, a model that is trained with uh, all the, the WAM open data set in the standard way. So uh, of course, it gets certain performance on all vehicles and on large vehicles. Here on the bottom is a system where we use 13% of label data. We train the off-board auto-labeling system. We complete the other 87% of sequences using that system. And so now we train a model using, well, 100% labeled sequences, but in a hybrid, labeled in a hybrid way. And so what we see there is actually the quality on average matches, or potentially even exceeds if you squint a little bit, the, the quality from the supervised boxes. But for a rare category, at least in the open data set, large vehicles are reasonably rare, we have a significant regression. So the auto-labeling system is not able to, with very few examples, produce good enough bounding boxes such that the model derived from the labels uh, is good on them. And so we come up short here, and we want to fill in this gap. Now, a natural way, one natural way to fill this gap is to look at active learning. Um, so you have the auto labeler is an option always to label a sequence, but we have the option given the detector, uh, which also of course have access to the feature of the detector. We can we can have some criterion here 
that picks out certain examples and say, okay, these are rare examples. They're worth labeling by humans. And so we can then send these few examples that we identified as interesting to uh, humans, not too many because it's uh, effort intensive. And then we create these scenarios which have mostly auto-labeled boxes, but then they have a few for the interesting cases they're labeled by humans. And now we can train with this combination uh, of boxes and hopefully fill in the gap. Now the main question is, uh, what is a suitable rareness criteria? We have a paper in this conference called uh, Rare Example Mining uh, that addresses this question. And before I go into the solution, I'll talk a little bit about what is really rare. So defining even what is rare is a bit challenging. So first, uh, rare is defined relative to a given population. For example, cyclists in urban environments are reasonably common, but on highways, they're very rare. And so the concept of rare is relative, not absolute. And second, uh, defining rare in a continuous setting is tricky. So unlike conventional work in long tail classification, uh, where there is well-defined boundaries between long tail classes, we're working with a continuum in feature space. So the class vehicle can have all kinds of different types of vehicles, shapes and sizes. Uh, here, things are a lot more homogeneous, typically. And also, unlike conventional words that treat long tail classification as a domain adaptation problem, uh, and domain adaptation is usually uh, the task of matching training and testing distributions better, we are mostly looking at the problem of increasing data support via mining. So we want to have a definition of rareness that mostly helps us fill in this distribution without relying as much on ontology, uh, right which is which is the new challenge so here in this slide i will show you a little bit of uh intuition about what rare examples mean and how they differ from hard examples so let's have y-axis easy to hard and on the x-axis we have common to rare so when you look at this you will see that hard examples are objectively ambiguous even for humans for example occluded vehicles can be very hard you barely see some of the parts of it, or you see very few points, it's hard to make a bounding box. But occluded objects are actually very common. They're not necessarily rare. Training on more hard examples like that does not help improve the model. We've already seen a lot. And rare examples are infrequent in the training set. Addition of rare data like this one can provide better coverage in the data distribution. We want these examples. And so how do we get these examples? I will show you next, a two different definitions of finding rare. Um, so one of them we call model-centric rareness. Uh, the key here is to look at this, all the set of uncertain examples. Um, and so they can be all in all these three quadrants. And so we take the uncertain examples, which we can mine by, for example, an ensemble of detectors and seeing that wherever they disagree, you have uncertainty. But you want to remove the hard objects. And hard, if you have a reasonable definition of hard, in our case, we can say, well, too few lighter points or object is maybe too far away, uh, then you get your definition of rare. Now, this, this uh, model-centric rareness works whenever you have some domain knowledge or understanding of what might be hard, but often that knowledge is limited, right? So maybe there are some other examples that are common that we cannot enumerate here in, in a natural way. So we have an alternative definition of rareness, which is called data-centric rareness. And uh, this does not make any special assumption on what might be uh, like hard, right? And uh, we instead provide obtain a direct estimate of object rareness by doing a estimation of the probability density of samples in the embedding space of a pre-trained detector model. So you have a detector, you have an object that you may think you want to check is rare or not. You have a prototypical bounding box. You can pull the features, region pull the features in this bounding box to obtain an embedding. And then we can, for all such embeddings of interest, we can train a normalizing flows model to estimate the probability density. This is an invertible uh, model. And here I'm showing you an intuition of uh the distribution that such a model can give you so uh what's closer to red is an area uh of higher density and what is in blue is an area of lower density 
And so lower density is what you want to mine, right? Because you haven't seen anything with those type of uh, features uh, much before. And so you want to label them too. Uh, and uh, let's look at uh, what the results look like. So the baseline is on top. We label 10% of uh, data with humans, and this is the baseline. This is an, a set of results we get. Uh, and uh, here I will focus on an example where we mine an additional 3% by using an ensemble of detectors. So we look for areas where the detectors are uncertain, and we label them. So you can see that this is very standard uh, technique, right? And you can see that, yes, with this method, we get some improvement in the regular objects. But here for large objects, which is our proxy rare subcategory, we actually see a decline. And below, you can see our uh, two respective uh, model-centric definitions, um, model-centric and data-centric RAM, especially uh, both of them uh, improve even more, both the regular and the long tail cases. So that valid, helps validate that our definition is helpful. And then, of course, on the bottom, we add auto labeling, which is where we started. Uh, if you add the auto labeling system and data centric RAM, you get yet stronger results because auto labeling is generally helpful for training models. And if we really, really want to maximize performance on the rare class, then having both model and data centric is even better. And so when you come back here to the initial case, you can see that with the system, we mostly did manage to close the gap in rare objects uh, and improve by relative 30% on long vehicles with very limited amount of uh, rare example mining and uh, labeling by humans, which is uh, great. Uh, one more shout out for a poster for you guys to check out at this conference. I showed you how to mine uh, rare examples for object detection, but uh, we also have work on efficient labeling for 3D semantic segmentation, which is a typically very effort intensive task. Uh, this will be an ECCV oral talk, so I invite you to check it out. Uh, just in summary, we co design an efficient labeling process and a learning algorithm that can take uh, very sparse scribbles in. Uh, that uh, or labels in the lighter point clouds. Um, and so with such a method, uh, we can match the quality on semantic kitty uh, by using just 0.1% of all lighter points being labeled. Um, so yeah, please uh, check it out. And uh, I will go on to the next topic, which is data augmentation. So we just talked about mining and labeling rare, new rare examples, but we can also focus on making the most of the examples we have, right? So we can try to apply augmentations, especially to the existing rare examples. And so uh, augmentations is a well-known technique, uh, that augmentation to improve neural networks, and it's been an area of work by our team for a while. So here I've illustrated a set of potential augmentation. You can apply it to an object, you can flip it or scale or drop laser points and so on. Um, so there's quite a number of things you can do. And the set of augmentations has a set of parameters associated with it. How much you, how often you apply the operation, how much of it you apply. And so these parameters actually affect the final performance. It's a reasonably large search space, about 30 parameters or so, and search in that parameter space for the best policy is a worst case exponential in the number of these parameters. And so we have two works to address this over the last couple of years. And they're both uh, handling this search with a fairly sophisticated method called progressive population-based augmentation, uh, which involves a population of models trained with different augmentation settings. So you have, say, this model with some augmentation that does reasonably well. Here's another model with some other augmentation that does also reasonably well. So then every once in a while, we resample the population of models and try to splice in augmentations, different augmentations from different successful models. And this works reasonably well. Uh, but I think here, here is an example. So it, what does it mean reasonably well? So as you, uh, you, know, you can push 
uh, the performance from maybe the black curve to the blue curve in the supervised case. So you're only using uh, sequences where you have done bounding boxes. Here is on the x-axis shows what percent of sequences that is. This is quality. And uh, orange adds, so let's say here at 30%, you're using 30% label and 70% unlabeled sequences, but you can still leak some uh, benefit at that operating point. So we can push generally uh, black to orange, um, which is significant gains. So that augmentation helps. However, such methods like PPBA uh, require complex infrastructure. So it's not clear that a small population of models evolved over many steps can even find the optimal parameter settings. And so we set ourselves the question, can we do better and simpler? And so uh, this is a uh, work in submission, um, but uh, we're presenting it anyway. Um, the idea here is, can we define a simple search space with just two hyperparameters as opposed to close to 30 in the general case? And then we do a simple grid search in that space to explore it better. And uh, this idea is inspired by the random augment work by Google Brain from CVPR, from New York, from CVPR 2020. And uh, the high level idea here is we want to factorize the set of uh, searches. And so we do, for each uh, augmentation operation, we do a separate small scale proxy search for two parameters. So there's the probability of applying the operation, and then maybe some parameter that corresponds to magnitude. For example, what's the maximum rotation angle? How big can it be? So we search and find good value for these. Uh, you can do it with just small search, just for that operation compared to the baseline and no operations. And then we align. So we want to normalize and center these parameters. So for each operation, the optimal parameter should map to roughly the same values. And then in this align and normalized and centered space, uh, we just do two degree search on two parameters, P and M. So more P and M or less P and M. And the, the search, so given a set of values for P and M, this is the full algorithm. It's very short pseudocode. You basically apply augmentations with some magnitude, and uh, that is it. And how well does this do? Well, it turns out it does a lot better than PPBA. So almost five points better for this example. Uh, it's a U-shaped uh, point pillars, and we push the quality dramatically uh, on the way more on that set validation. Um, and uh, there is some other interesting insight. So um, we experimented with taking the U-shaped point pillar model and scaling it uh, to at least twice the capacity. And then we take, uh, the initial baseline augmentation operations that are usually operations that are popular for U-shaped point pillar models. And we apply them on the two models. And what happens is, uh, well, that's the blue boxes. So yes, you improve by having a larger model, but the gain is limited and even some metrics uh, can get worse. Now, applying LiDAR augment, custom search for each ar architecture uh, makes a dramatic difference. and What's particularly interesting is the large model. It pushes the quality, or the quality gap is even higher. And so the insight is we actually want to optimize the augmentation strategy when changing model architecture or capacity. This is intuitive. The more, the larger the capacity is, probably the more augmentations you want to apply. Um, but this only proves that intuition. And one interesting thing that happens is so you take a fairly simple model, which is point pillars. And you push it to 71% on, um, on the Waymo data set. If you look here, the vanilla point pillars is at just 55, and we got it to 71, which is very competitive now to some of the state of the art. So PVR CNN, dramatically, well, more sophisticated method. Uh, and now we almost matched it with the simple method. So, so that's not to be underestimated. The second thing I will point out is. Uh, so SW former, we set the new state of the art on the Waymo open data set, right? In uh, lighter detection methods. Uh, applying augmentation pushes the state of the art even higher. So now we are one and one and a half percent high. Last uh, topic I will talk about is open set perception and prediction. This is from a paper also in this conference. Um, and 
and the motivation here is the following. So we talked so far about uh, 3D object detection models that are bootstrapped with expensive human labels and defined to handle a preset uh, number of object types. So this paradigm is quite successful by now in ordinary examples. And uh, also with the techniques I just presented in this talk, you can get it quite successful on um, handling even long tail examples from these classes. However, beyond this pretty fine closed set, there are many more object types. So we could keep extending our ontologies and naming them and mining for each type se separately. But the natural question is, can we do a more scalable approach? So of course, we do want to deal with dinosaurs running around and with um, taxing airplanes on the road too. Uh, after all, if they can be on the road, we want to do something reasonable. And so, but we don't want to name them and mine specifically this object. So uh, we have started leveraging motion estimation, which is a semantics agnostic task as a source of supervision for objects like this. And I believe this is an exciting direction. And uh, I will present to you briefly uh, the specific details of our work at this conference and the problem formulation for this task. So uh, our specific method takes raw lighter sequences as input, and to obtain and supervise the auto labels, we designed two key components of scene flow and estimation, and then auto meta labeling. Without human labels, we can estimate the 3D scene flow of every lighter form. Then in the blue box, we go through a series of clustering, tracking, shape registration to obtain object labels and 3D boundary boxes for these tracklets, which essentially creates uh, automatic uh, training data on which we can apply, uh, I mean, ultimately train uh, 3D object detectors and also trajectory predictors for these objects. Um, this is just one method. I think this is still relatively early in this task. Uh, a lot of headroom is possible. I invite the community to consider it more seriously. It's a fascinating task. Uh, here is uh, um, some results. So this is a point pillars network trained with our system to detect any moving objects. And this is done without any human labeled bounding boxes whatsoever. And so you can see that it tracks a lot of objects quite well, pedestrians, vehicles, and uh, quite stably. So it's a detector, actually. It doesn't track them. I mean, it's a frame by frame detection. That's why the colors change in this case. Um, and I think one other thing is interesting is that uh, because we're not constrained to predefined classes, we can capture objects that typically are not necessarily labeled coherently in the ground truth. For example, uh, well, we label pedestrians often in the ground truth, but that misses the object associated with them, the stroller. Our automatic label method directly uh, infers and correctly infers that this is roughly the same object moving coherently and bounding boxes. Um, and in terms of quantitative metrics in the open set setting, uh, when we assume that human labels are only available for some categories and not others, so in this case, we can set up a test case where we have only vehicle labels available, but we don't have pedestrian labels, so vice versa. We found that uh, unsupervised auto labels provide very helpful supervision, so we get quite reasonable results for the object we've never seen uh, compared to uh, the case of, well, this is the, the supervised case. Obviously, we're not going to detect this object. And uh, similar things happen for prediction. So we have uh, trying to predict the behavior of objects we've never seen. Uh, using our auto labels in addition to the ground truth for one object does much better for the other object than just in the purely supervised case. Again. I think it's still early. I think given the rich structure, multiple sensors, and temporal consistency that we can enforce, we can go quite far here. And I encourage people to uh, explore this task further. On this, uh, I will conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, you can see a lot more of our work at either this conference or at this website, waymo.com research where we have posted a lot of the papers that we have managed to publish so far. Uh, thanks again, and uh, have a great day.